It's good to be back with you tonight. And thanks for that uh, good meal you provided. Wow. I would, uh, truly appreciate that. And I was able to be at the Davis. was here for lunch today and was uh, well taken care of. Uh, Y'all are very, very kind. It's been a little bit intimidating to me to come here and preach because I know you have Aaron and uh, he's recognized as one of the finest preachers that uh, we have in our whole fellowship of church congregations. I don't just say that to be polite. I mean, that's, that's a fact. And so I thought, wow, well, I thought at least, uh, I said, you know, I know I can't compare to him as a preacher, but at least surely I'll be better looking. <laughs> I'd like to ask you again tonight as we prepare to go into the Word of God. This is, this is hard. When you come in, you don't know people and you don't know what they're dealing with in their lives. So, you know, I, I, I really think about that. that I, I don't know what it is. I, I just know every one of us brings something in here tonight that we're dealing with. You know, I, I don't know what it is. But many, many years ago, I heard a song, and part of that song said, Jesus knows me better than I even know myself. And that's true. And you know, I don't know tonight what it is you bring in here to the room. I, I have no idea. But I know that God knows. He knows what you need. He knows what you're dealing with. And so would you just take a moment, and would you very private? you very personal. Would you ask God to use this time to help you in your life tonight? And I'll pray out loud and we'll go into our message. Let's pray. I'm sure that all of you have heard that old story of the couple which had been married for 25 years. The day they celebrated their silver wedding anniversary, all of the festivities had drawn to a close. The couple retreated to the comfort of their home. And the husband took his usual place in the house and the wife and then she got settled into her place. He finally noticed that his wife was crying. So he mustered up all the husbandly compassion that he had garnered through their 25 years of wedded bliss. He looked at his wife and he said to her, What's wrong with you? <laughs> she said, We've been married 25 years. You never tell me you love me. He said, I told you 25 years ago I love you, and if it ever changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I'm really concerned tonight that there are a lot of people who one time stood before a group of people professing his or her faith in Christ. Since that time, they have been totally silent regarding where they are with their faith. Brothers and sisters, life is too complex. And life's challenges are much too difficult to be handled victorious without a deep, person 
and intense faith in Christ. Amen. Now folks, I don't think you all are slow to hear. I don't think you're slow to learn. But I really want you to think about that statement. Would you allow me to repeat it? Life is too complex. And life's challenges are much too difficult to be handled victoriously without a deep, personal, and intense faith in Christ. And you know, I'm convinced tonight that there are a lot of people who believe with all of their heart that Jesus is more than a man. They truly believe that He is the Christ, that He is the Son of the living God. And they believe that their only hope of heaven is through who He is and what He did for them. But these same people struggle to see how it is that our faith in Christ connects with our living in this world. And brothers and sisters, if Jesus Christ cannot help us in this life, how could we possibly trust Him to help us in that which is life everlasting? I'd like for you to take your Bible tonight. I'd like for you to open it to the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter. And once you've opened your Bible to 1 Peter, just stop at the first chapter, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. I will begin reading at verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. The Apostle Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Now folks, as we read through that here so quickly tonight, I know that it's just virtually impossible to pick up all that the Apostle Peter was trying to say. But I wonder if you noticed as we read through those verses, did you notice that there was one word that Peter used over and over and over did you notice how many times he used the word faith or belief? But what I want you to notice is, I want you to notice the context in which Peter wrote about our faith in Christ. But you see what, the, what, what he's writing about here. It's not about our faith in the person of Christ that he really is divine. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about our faith as it connects with our living in this world. And if we went through that whole passage of Scripture, verse by verse, and if we broke it down into its most minute parts, we would actually find that, 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 that Peter wants us to understand that it is our faith in Christ 
that gives us a reasonable perspective to life. Think about it. It's our faith in Christ that gives us a reasonable perspective to life. Now, he actually drew that out in three very distinct ways here in this passage of Scripture. First of all, he said that it's our faith in Christ that is the cause of our joy. I love the way that he starts off this passage of Scripture where he simply says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again this evening, as I said this morning, if we could simply step back through the corners of time, if we could read this the way that it was originally written, that word that comes across to us in our modern English as praise is the word that I believe they pronounced it something like eulogia. It's the word that we get our modern English word, eulogy. Now you know what a eulogy is, I'm sure. You know, it's those nice things you say about people, whether they deserve them or not. I heard about a preacher not uh, too long ago one time that he was uh, preaching a funeral of, uh, uh, of a man, and he was pronouncing the eulogy of this deceased person, and the widow actually got up and went and looked in the casket to see if that was actually her husband. <laughs> that's what, that's a, what a eulogy is, you know. It's, those nice things you say about people, whether they deserve them or not. And that's the word that Peter used here. And folks, you need to understand, when you read the Bible, just let me throw this in, that, that there's more than one word in the New Testament that is translated blessed. And like when Jesus gave the Beatitudes and He said, blessed are thee, and, and you go through those Beatitudes, that's a totally different word than we have right here. Wow, I now I'm going to preach on that. That's such a powerful word, that word bless. It's the word makarios. This is the word eulogia. It literally means to speak well of. That's what that word literally means. And so we have a young child here. And this child does something that, that, that's a bit of an accomplishment for a young child. And we praise that child. We speak well of the accomplishment of that child. Or one of the brothers or sisters here has done something in, in, in our community or something. And we recognize them. We speak well of them. We are praising that person for what they have done. That is exactly the word Peter used here. And he says... Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I want to emphasize, in its most literally, literal rendering, what Peter said is, always be ready, willing, and able to speak well of God. Notice that there are no qualifiers to it. There are no disqualifiers from it. He simply said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, it's not only the translation of this passage that I like. I want you to notice the grammatical construction of the New International Version here that I read from tonight. Did you notice as we read that, that it said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then they placed an exclamation point. <coughs> You know, said, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder tonight, is it true of you, is it true of me, that our lives are continual testimonies of praise to our God? That regardless of what's going on within us, regardless of what's going on around us, regardless of the circumstances of our lives, that we are always ready, willing, and able to speak well of God. That's what this passage says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what we find is that Peter didn't just say, well, you just go around and say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise. That's not what he's saying. Peter said that there are reasons that we must always be ready, willing, and able to speak well of God. He said that we need to always be ready, willing, and able to speak well of God because God has shared with us His great mercy. Now, I mentioned this morning that I was reared in the church and 
Folks, despite the fact that from the time that I was born into this world, all I've ever known is, is, is the church, I have to admit to you that for years and years, I didn't realize there was a difference between mercy and grace. I thought that you could call it mercy. I thought you could call it grace. I thought those words were synonymous, that mercy and grace were the same thing. And it's really not been all that many years ago that I came to learn that not only are mercy and grace not the same thing, matter of fact, mercy and grace are totally different. They're poles apart. Uh, I imagine that most of us are a little bit more familiar with grace, you know. We sing that song, Amazing Grace, and we use that word so often in, 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 in our spiritual dialect, our spiritual conversations, grace, 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 you know, and, and, and we're familiar with that. And, 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 and some have said that grace is that unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor from God. Now, if you've not gotten to know me very well yet, it won't take you long, but one of the things you'll learn about me is I am a very simple-minded person. No one in my life has ever confused me with Einstein. <laughs> and, 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 and my boys, I mentioned this morning, I have a couple boys, and my boys, you know, while they're both college educated and they've got advanced degrees, you know, and every once in a while, we're not able, all three of us, to be together real often. And on those rare occasions when all three of us are together, they occasionally want to engage dad in some intellectual conversation, you know, so that the, I know the money wasn't in vain. And, 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 and so, and so they'll, they'll engage me in this intellectual conversation. And we won't get very far in that conversation. And one of those boys will look at me and say, Dad, you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And folks, I know that. I'm pretty simple-minded. I worked for a number of years as as a, 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 a president of Bluefield College of Evangelism. And I had a couple of buddies, one our academic dean and our Old Testament professor. Man, we were just not only colleagues, we were just buddies. And we'd go out to eat at least once a week if we could, if our schedules would allow them all. And old Don and Reggie, man, these guys, they could, they could talk about the things of antiquity. They could talk about the Hebrew. They could talk about the Greek. They could talk about all these real academic things. And every once in a while, they'd look to me that I, I, I am the president of the school. And they'd want me to say something. And you know what I'd say? I'd say something like this. wonder how they get that white stuff in those Twinkies. <laughs> and, 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 and so you just find out that I'm just not the, just not the you know, I'm pretty simple minded. And, 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 and so here, they can say that this grace is this unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor from God. But folks, here's how it resonates with me. Grace is getting what one does not deserve. Grace is getting what one does not deserve. And whereas grace is getting what one does not deserve, mercy is not getting what one does deserve. Isn't that great? Not only are they not the same, they're literally poles apart. Grace is getting what one does, what one does not deserve. Mercy is not getting what one does deserve. Now I know it will never happen like this, but let's just pretend that it did. And we stand before God and our soul is hanging in the balance and we're to be judged for eternity. And if God were to ask us, why should I let you into my heaven, what could we say? <coughs> Folks, if God were to ask me, why should I let you into my heaven, I have to hang my head in shame and embarrassment. The Bible tells me that I was made in the image of God. And I want to tell you, folks, if God is no more capable than I am, and if God has no better heart than I have, if God has no more power than I have, if God has no more intellect than I have, He's really not much of a God. And yet I'm going to stand before that very God. And I'm going to say that God, you made me in your image. And this is all of the glory that I would bring to you. Why should God ever let me into His heaven after what I've done to His image? Why should God ever let me into His heaven? When I know what He's told me to do, and I flat out refuse to do it. 
And although he commanded me what to do, I flat out said, God, I don't care that you're God. I'm going to do what I want to do the way I want to do it, when I want to do it, regardless of who you are or what you've said. And when it comes to the commandments of God, I have flat rebelled against God. Why should God let me into His head? But you see, it's not only that there's rebellion. Sometimes I know what God has said, and it's just a choice of when I want to do it. And that choice, still to this night, has resulted in I've not done it. That's what the Bible says to him that knows the good thing to do and does not do it. To him, it is sin. How many people should I have called to offer a word of encouragement? How many times did I pass by someone's home of a brother or a sister in Christ that I knew needed a hug, they needed a word of cheer, they needed a prayer to build them up, and I flat out would rather go home or I would rather go somewhere else. I would rather do something else than to do what I needed to do for a brother or sister in need. How many times have I chosen to lay down and go to sleep rather than to pray for someone who is desperately in need? How many times have I chosen to, to, to engage in some leisure activity rather than to write a note of appreciation, rather than to write a note of I'm praying for you? How many times in my life have I chosen to do what I want to do and chosen to not do what God would have wanted me to do? And if God were to ask me, why should I let you into my heaven? I say tonight, there is no reason why God should ever let me into His heaven. But you know tonight, we didn't come in here and sing this old hee-haw song, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> we didn't sing that here tonight. But I tell you, in church assemblies like this, folks, we do sing songs like this. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing it. We're in church crack. <laughs> Shout. <laughs> the victory. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, do you understand that we sing songs like that because before the world ever was God made a choice and the choice God made was I know they're going to mar my image I know they're going to disobey my commands I know they're going to know the good things to do and choose not to do them but I don't want to give them what they deserve Praise God. Woo! Oh, I forgot where I was. <laughs> you know what one songwriter said one time? The world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. The world didn't give it to me. The world can't take it away. And it doesn't matter what my circumstances are in life. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. It doesn't matter what's going on within me. God made a choice. He doesn't want to give me what I deserve. Praise the Lord. Oh, oh church. Woo. He says, uh, he says uh, when you can't think what you want to say, you go, Woo! Um, <laughs> He's 
said it's not just that God doesn't want to give us what we deserve. He said God has given us new life. He said in His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. And here we are tonight, folks. We have new life in Christ. Matter of fact, it was Jesus who said, except a man be born again, he won't even see the kingdom. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he won't enter the kingdom. Don't be amazed that I said unto you, ye must be born again. And here tonight, when we were buried in those waters of baptism, that burial going under the water was a symbolism of the old person that is being put away and we are raised up from the water, a new person, born again, born from on high. God is our Father. God's Spirit lives inside of us and we have a new life. Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we never stumble, that we never fail, we don't fall. That's not what it's saying. But it's said like that song that one time was written that said, thanks to Calvary, I'm not the man I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than before. And I know I'm not everything I ought to be. I'm not everything I want to be. But hallelujah, praise Jehovah, I'm not what I used to be. Amen. Woo! <laughs> Does this resonate with anybody besides me? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> But I want you to notice what he says about this new life. He said this new life is as sure as the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. He said he's caused us to be born again into a living hope. as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, didn't we just a couple weeks ago, didn't we right here celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, didn't we? I heard you had a big crowd. I heard the house was filled. I heard they had to park on the grass around here. Wasn't that a great day? Yes. And do you realize as that's been over 2,000 years that Jesus had been raised. If He really hadn't resurrected from the grave, surely in 2,000 years, someone would have found His corpse. Someone would have found His skeleton. Someone would have said, it's a hoax, it's not true. Jesus is right here because He died. But no one's ever proved that He did rise again because His body is gone. There is no skeletal remains. He has been resurrected from the grave. Tyrants haven't been able to remove Christians from the earth. And although there have been those who tried to wash Christianity from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who believe it, still today she stands. And tonight, right here in a culture that doesn't want our God, that doesn't believe our gospel, tonight this church is right here and we are praising and worshiping Jesus and they can't stop us. It is true. Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. And as certain as He has risen from the dead, God has given us new life. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. So what's He say? <coughs> well, He said a whole lot about it. I know. <coughs> but here's what He said in some. Look at verse 6. In this, you rejoice. You see, that's what I'm saying. It's our faith in Christ that is the cause of our joy. In this, you rejoice. No, he didn't. He said, in this, you greatly rejoice. Woo! Come on, church. Get with it. <laughs> Man, I remember when I was a little kid, I was born and reared in southern Indiana. And uh, <clears throat> we had summer day of vacation Bible school back then. Ten days of vacation Bible school. Boy, that was tough. 
on a boy that don't like crafts. <laughs> I think I've been permanently scarred. <laughs> Oh man, them popsicle sticks <laughs> and glue. That's what happened to my brain. I went to VBS so much my brain got fried from the glue. But we used to sing a little song in the summer vacation Bible school and like this. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart, down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Did y'all sing that? Well, here's what we sing back home. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. The leader go, where? And you go, down in my heart, where? Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, where? Down in my heart. And then you have to sing it again. And every time you sing it, you get louder, you know. Third, fourth time, you're saying, got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, where? Down in my heart, where? Down in my heart. Got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, where? You know, you're no longer singing. You're screaming. Your face is red. Your veins are about that. And you come to that last line. You remember that story of that kid preacher that wanted the church to know how good a preacher he was so he memorized his sermons? <laughs> I just have to look at you. <laughs> just like a Mac. That boy, he gets up there. Hold, I come quickly. <laughs> but couldn't remember what I was supposed to say. Jesus said in 
John 16. In the world, you will have tribulation. The Apostle Paul <coughs> said, Luke wrote it down in Acts 14. It is through much tribulation that we will enter the kingdom. If I had time to go over to chapter 4 of this very book we're reading from tonight, Peter would say, Beloved, don't be surprised if I ever try which is to come along. From the very words of God, I warned you three times. You are going to face some very hard times in your life. And can I just throw in a personal note? Sometimes those hard times really hurt. They really hurt. But may I ask you a question? When you're going through those hard times, and you really hurt. Do you find yourself drawing nearer to God? Do you find yourself praying more? Do you find yourself wanting the assurance and comfort of the people of God? And I want to say something, church. Sometimes Jesus is coming. church, and I mean that, I guarantee you, when Jesus comes again, you are going to want to be as close to him as you could have been. And if it's my heart times, bring me closer to Jesus. When he comes again, I will praise the Lord that I was as close to Jesus as I was. You see, God doesn't want me to suffer. God doesn't want me to hurt. But when I hurt, when I suffer, God says, Carrie, I want you to know that when Jesus comes again, you're going to praise me for this. Praise the Lord. You know how he wraps it up? In verse 9. Have you gotten it yet? First of all, it's our faith right now that's the cause of our joy. It's our faith that's a comfort in our trials. But he wraps it up in verse 9. He says, you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here's, what, here's, here's how I'd say it. It's our faith in Christ that is our confidence for eternity. I, I, I want to tell you a story. It's going to take a few minutes to tell this story, and that's going to be the end. But... I became a Christian at a young age, and I preached my first sermon when I was 13. I made a public decision in my home church in a revival meeting when I was 14 years old that I wanted to be a preacher, and that's all I've ever wanted to do in my adult life, <coughs> be a preacher. And God worked it out for me, and I'll spare you all the details, but God worked it out for me that 
When I finished high school, I was able to go to a little preacher training college that was located in Bluefield, West Virginia. It was called Bluefield College of Evangelism. My first year as a student there was the school's second year of existence. It was a brand new school. And one of the decisions that the founders of the school made that I thought was just super is that they said every year we're going to offer some of our Bible classes at night so that people from there in churches and all the community could come in and learn the Bible better. One of the guys that came, worked in a factory there in the Bluefield area, uh, his name was J.E. Meadows, and J.E. came to the night classes, and the whole time that I was there as a student, every semester J.E. was there taking classes at night. And then, after I finished and was out in ministry, well, they had an alumni rally, they call it every year, and I'd go back. And you know who was still there taking night classes? J.E. Meadows. Some of us guys had been there in the earlier days. We kind of picked on J.E. We said, J.E., you're the only guy that's been here since school began that can't graduate. And, you know, we'd pick on him and all. But now J.E. is still working in that plant in the area. But now he's preaching in one of the area local congregations. J.E. is every week teaching Bible study at a senior citizen's high rise. J.E. was a gifted singer and musician, and he used what vacation time he had from the plant. He used that to go to revivals and camp meetings and share his talents with, with, with more and more people. We actually had students at Bluefield that J.E. had won to the Lord, and now these men are wanting to be preachers of the gospel. It is a great testimony. And folks, I, I find it was privileged to get to serve my alma mater as the president of the school. And Jay Meadows now, he is a member of the college board of directors. That means he's my boss. And I walked into the administration building one day, and Jay is there, and he saw me. He came running up to me. And he reached out his hand, wanted to shake my hand. He said, Carrie, have you heard? Have you heard? I said, heard what, Jay? He said, I've retired! I've retired! He said, now I'm going to be able to do something for the Lord. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. You know, I, 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 didn't, I, well, I looked at I just said, I'll be smart. You know, I said, well, J.E., it's about time you did something for the Lord. <laughs> really didn't know what to say. A wonderful, wonderful man. And folks, please let me finish the story here. I don't know what J, more J.E. could have done, but we never got to see that. It was just a couple weeks after J.E. told me he'd retired, now he's going to be able to do something more for the Lord, you know. J.E. was diagnosed with a terminal illness. It was very aggressive. Very savage. And I tried to stay in the best contact that I could with J.E. I love J.E. Mills. And this disease, it just ravaged his body. His voice was so weak, he could hardly even hear him speak. And I went to J.E.'s house one day, and he was in hospital bed there at his house. And we both knew that this is going to be the last time we we're ever going to see each other here in this room. And Jay was so weak I knew not to stay very long. But before I left I said, Jay, can I pray with you? Of course Jay wanted me to pray. I put my hand on Jay's hand and I started to pray. Folks, when I started that prayer, emotionally, I just lost it. Absolutely lost it. I, I loved you. I finally got myself pulled together enough to finish the prayer. And when I finished the prayer, J.E. didn't let go of my hand. And with that scarcely audible voice, he said, Carrie, don't cry. This is what we live for. And 
folks, I want to share something with you. I have been privileged to see a lot of truly great Christian influences in my life. And J.E. Meadows was one of those people. J.E. Meadows showed me how a Christian ought to live. But I say with no reservation, J.E. Meadows taught me how to die. And I wouldn't dare do it, but if I could bring J.E. down here tonight, if I could just wrap my arms around him one more time, hug his neck and look into his eyes, man, his eyes twinkle. J.E. had a grin that went from ear to ear. If I could just one more time. But if I could look down there, he's a little shorter than I. And if I could look down and say, J.E., how was it that you could show me how to live? You could teach me how to die. I know J.E. would look up at me and he'd smile and those eyes would twinkle and he'd say, Carrie, I knew how to live. And I knew how to die. Because I believe in Jesus. And I want to ask you tonight, do you know how to live? And are you ready to die? Because you believe in Jesus. Life is too complex. And life's challenges are much too great to be handled victoriously without a deep, personal, and intense faith in Christ. Do you believe it? If you believe it, do what he says to do. He said, unless you repent, you will perish. He said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And you don't ever forget, it was Jesus who said, you be faithful. Hey!